Hello and welcome to episode 206 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fan's weekly podcast of many topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and I am joined for part two of our Wild Arms 3 discussion alongside social media maven Joe Padilla. Hey there. So, Joe, um, this was your first Wild Arms game, my second Wild Arms game, and uh, sadly, I don't think either of us finished our first Wild Arms game. Um, I, I uh, got about 25 or 30 hours in, but I understand this game is 45 or 50 hours, so that is... I, I fell well short. I had a very, very challenging recent week. There uh, illnesses and uh, moving house and uh, a lot of uh, housework was involved. But you made it considerably further than I did, right? Yes. Um, the the in-game clock absolutely lies. I have no idea because my in-game, yeah, my in-game, in-game clock... clock... My in-game clock says like 10 hours and I've definitely crossed the 20 mark. Oh, yeah. mine. I, I forget when exactly it starts and stops, but it does not do it well at all um because mine says 35 and i'm probably like 55 or something and i am on i am on the very last dungeon very end of the game so i'm I'm pretty sure it does not tick down during battle no Um, i don't think so and i and i'm pretty sure it does when you're just going around town and a world map but i'm less certain about dungeons zero percent certain about cutscenes. The the, the in game clock is not reliable at all. Uh but regardless, Wild Arms Three is a pretty meaty RPG. Uh if it's over fifty hours for you, and I was under the impression it was around fifty, that that's not nothing. And I I uh I, I feel a little bad because every time I get into this game and get into that dungeon town rhythm, uh I'm really, really enjoying it. Uh this is a game that uh I don't know, I guess it skipped me by a little bit. I was still going through the PS1 oeuvre of, of JRPGs when this game came out in 2002. But even though I am not near done, I think I want to still try and finish this this year just to, just to sort of cross it off the list because it, it, it seems almost a shame to stop where I am with it. Uh, you haven't finished either, but do you think you're going to uh, uh, like close the book on it for real after we're done recording? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so... Like I'm so close to being done with it. I and I have the day off work tomorrow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow through that. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I want to revisit some of the basics around this game first. Uh, we talked a lot about the setting of the game and how it um really is invested in the sort of American Wild West setting with guns and horses and trains. I, I didn't even mention this before. Like before you get your sand ship. Uh, you're taking, you're basically taking the train from place to place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and just going from train station to train station and and riding and riding horses around. Like, and I mentioned how much I like I liked the action scenes of fighting on horseback in the previous episode. Mm-hmm. It, it it really is, you know, uh, embracing this these Wild West roots, but deep down, it's still an RPG that's you know about an ancient and uncovering the secrets of ancient civilizations and lost technologies. Like how, I don't know, it feels like 40% of the JRPGs I've ever played are trying to be uh, Hayao Miyazaki's Castle in the Sky. or You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's, it's funny that you bring that up because, like, basically that. <laughs> basically that happens later in the game where there is basically a dungeon in the sky. Um, and you have to shoot missiles at it for it to appear or else it just looks like a bunch of waves. Well, I've played at least three Final Fantasy games where you have to, you know, go through dungeons or lost technology in the sky. Yeah. Your, your floating continents and what have you. But this game really feels like a, a really specific interpretation of that. And I think it's also true for at least the first two Wild Arms games. Uh, the Wild Arms games that I know of, like, all are a post-apocalypse setting. Uh, like, all of the ancient technology of the old civilization is covered up in sand. Um, there's a there's a sort of a solitude, and uh, and like lo- like lone or small group of di- drifters wandering through the desert kind of kind of feeling, and uh, in Wild Arms three at least probably more than half of the dungeons are ancient ruins. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, probably seventy five percent of the dungeons are ancient ruins. I'm trying to think of ones that aren't. Like, there's a couple of caves, then the goblin hideout. That's the first encounter in the whole game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but almost everything is some ancient ruins or some revived demon technology. 
and for most of the game, you're basically a scavenger going through these ruins that either are, you know, sort of like stone temple pyramid feeling or even like a like semi-modern technological facility feeling, right? Ah, uh, yes, yes, uh, stone temple pilots feeling, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the game... Um, kind of revolves around those and there's some there's some mines that you go to and such but this is uh this is a, a jrpg for the archaeologists out there yeah and a lot again a lot of jrpgs have this feeling of a, an ancient civilization with superior technology and you're rediscovering or reinterpreting this ancient civilization but for wild arms it's like the basis of this entire world like people are surviving uh using these arms which i think which even stands for like the the uh the acronym arm is uh is like ancient relic memory or something or oh shoot or, or ancient ruins memory something I mean, like to, that yeah yeah i'd have to look it up exactly but the uh like everything around this world revives around ancient technology that people don't totally understand and there's even the arc of destiny cult which is i'm not sure if you want to call them a cult or a church or an organization uh they they basically their base is the ancient spaceship that the first denizens of the world came in on, which they rediscovered and refurbished, and they basically are dedicated to finding as much ancient technology as possible and improving the lives of people using it. It's it, which is uh, which makes me suspicious because I'm always suspicious of semi-religious organizations and JRPGs, but all, but also is a I don't know a, a kind of a interesting mostly positive interpretation of what a uh, a cult would be in this world. Now, again, I only played through the first half of the game. In, in the second half, are the Ark of Destiny people like surprise late game villains, or do they all secretly were they all secretly run by the demons all along? Like, I don't know, you know, like a, like like certain uh, <laughs> certain other RPGs that I probably shouldn't <laughs> spoil. Um, honestly, they. I I was looking for that too. I was like, oh, I'm just waiting for this. I'm just waiting for this Jim Jones villain turn or something yeah, like yeah, that. This, yeah, this leader guy was very suspicious to me. Yeah, but uh, not really. He uh, just kind of was a solid guy. <laughs> he helped you find. Um, he felt he helped you find basically the the most lush and uh, green part of Felgaia that still existed, and uh, he and his followers helped point you in the correct. Uh, directions most of the time and give you money for for uh doing jobs for them they yeah it i bet if there was there was more time in the game and they were going to explore it more you would see that uh yeah it, it's pretty much a cult but but my overall view of them was pretty positive and unless in these next these very last couple hours of this you know pretty lengthy RPG. There's a massive unexpected turn, uh, which I'm not saying there won't be, but I would highly doubt it. Um, they're a good group of people who are trying to do well, even if they come across uh, a little, hi, uh, I'm here to talk with you about God. <laughs> in addition to the Ark of Destiny, we have a group that we talked about a little bit in the previous episode, the Council of Seven. Yes, so... Of the of the Council of Seven, um, the three prophets still exist because with the Council of Seven, you know there was this um, there was this accident ten years ago and they all died, but the three prophets remain. And then Virginia's father Werner is still alive, but only sort of. <laughs> um, so the other three are kind of are kind right, of left he's, in memory. He's basically. Uh, Werner is basically a data ghost, right? He uh, like he created the data backup of himself to to try and save the world as best he could in in the event of his own death. Is is my understanding of it? But I haven't gotten to that point of the story. Yeah, he yeah. So he that that's pretty much it. That he exists as this sort of data ghost, given mass and such. So when Virginia is like daddy and hugs him, like she feels that she's actually hugging her father. Um, and it kind of brings up the this question of okay if this if this projection has Werner's memories and his personality and all of this and he's very very similar to the real flesh and blood Werner um, how far removed 
is he from being from him actually being Werner, which I think is a very interesting concept and one I'm still not sure of. So, Also with Jet, because uh, at, after one point, another one of the Council of Seven that did, that, um, did not survive that accident was a man named Enduro. Mm -hmm. And he was maybe the architect of a project to try to, I, th I think, try to create a human that was more suited to live in this world. And the result of that project was Jet. The reason Jet doesn't have memories is because he was created artificially in that lab that you explore in the in the first half of the game, and and Jet and Jet's situation feels similar to the situation of the character in Wild Arms One, who's revealed to be non-human. And uh, and 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 also you have the character of Asgard, who is a golem revived with de demon technology that uh, that the three prophets made, and Asgard. As Asgard fights you more and, and and sort of takes in more data from his environment, he gains sentience and reason and possibly also emotions uh, to a degree. And so, like this exploration of humanism and artificial intelligence, uh, again shows up a couple times throughout Wild Arms and is maybe a surprising element in a game that feels like a Wild West RPG at first. Yeah, I, I think yeah, the the sort of. Um what makes what makes a human yeah i definitely think is really is really focused on those three characters and i think they're kind of varying degrees at least for at least for me this is all very subjective um but for me i if i'm kind of applying a very subjective turing test or something um i'm not seeing asgard as as human i am questioning whether i see Werner as human but I absolutely see Jet as human. The circumstances for all three of them are different. Again, uh, I used the absolutely. term yeah, I used the term data ghost for this version of Werner that we encounter in the game because again, because he's a data backup. He's he is like an a, an image of Werner at the time of his death or just before his death. And uh, Jet was crafted in a lab to be a uh, a sort of neo human. I don't. I don't know exactly what term they use for him because I, I, I'm sort of right before, I'm or right after that point where you learn about him in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but like he is, you know, he definitely has emotions and feelings, but although he doesn't have memories because of the nature of his creation. But uh, he, he doesn't even realize what he is until he's informed about it. And Asgard, mm -hmm. Asgard's kind of a baby. Like he's, uh, he was brought into the world as a blank slate golem, and is. Uh, developing like reason and sentience as a result of a, a sort of like of, of an AI program absorbing as much data as possible. So Asgard f like feels less human than Werner or Jet, but maybe given enough time and given the opportunity, uh, Asgard could become a, a, a neo human like Jet. It's, but we, we won't know because I mean, you fight a couple boss battles against Asgard and that's basically all she wrote. Um, and, and but, yeah. but but the fact that a game is like feels like a Wild West RPG at the beginning, and then you and then it you know goes into this phase where it feels like you're just searching ruins for ancient technology, like like you know Castle in the Sky, Laputa, and now and then you you go into revealing that all of these robot characters or non-human characters are sort of discovering humanity or asking the question, are they humans or not? That that goes that's. I, those are surprising places for these games to go, at least to me. Yeah, I yeah, I definitely um, agree with that. And with with a character like Asgard, just because uh, I don't see him as human, I, it doesn't mean that I didn't feel for him um, because of towards the end of um, basically when he is no longer in the game, mm -hmm. he is searching. He is searching for essentially searching for his master in the afterlife and he comes to you for a fight um, fully intending to lose, although he doesn't go easy on you. Um, and he kind of knows his purpose is to fight and serve. Is the game clear on who Asgard's master is? Cause I'm not really sure myself. Is, I mean, isn't, is it melody? <laughs> I had a little trouble with that. I possibly Lee Holtz. Uh, hmm. I was, I wasn't terribly sure in going through some, uh, some wikis and stuff. I, I wasn't, I still wasn't exactly sold on who exactly that was. Okay. 
um, which could be that I missed it, other people missed it, there might be localization issues, uh, I'm not sure. But I, I think it's less, less so important who his master was that he was trying to, that he was someone who was in servitude and had he been given more time and more data may have kind of broken free from those, from that bondage that he was essentially held in. Right. And okay, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, I, we also learn in the first half of the game or maybe like the second quarter of the game that uh, Maya isn't exactly who she seems to be. Uh, her her uh, her swordsman butler friend mentions that Maya has powers that allow her to uh, basically take on the abilities of um, books she reads, and I, I think that she's <laughs> I think she's a bit of a manga or a comics addict because in the second and third boss fight that you have with her, uh, she's a magical girl with like witch powers in one of them, and then a martial arts girl with uh, you know powerful offense in the in the next time. So it makes me wonder if like if she could go through the entire Shonen Jump catalog. And, you know, like, be, maybe there's an, I, I don't know how many times you fight her because I didn't, I didn't be, uh, come close to beating the game. But, like, are, is there, are there later battles with her where she's a, I don't know, a, a ninja or a super pirate or <laughs> a, a Shinigami? I, I don't know. Like, like how, how deep do her powers go exactly? Uh, so the last costume that, the last new costume that I saw was um, she was basically hacking into these um, these computers and she kind of took on this uh, this sort of like <laughs> hacker costume. I don't. She kind of looked like a librarian, <laughs> but that allowed her to kind of interface with these with these computers and, and such. Yeah, um, and, uh, were the prophets or um, or or the demons trying to use her powers? Like, I, like I, I know I read about that a little bit, but I didn't get far enough. Yeah, so so she had some she has some sort of powers that um, the demon Siegfried, who um, shows up and turns the uh, the dying Lee Hall, Malik and Melody into kind of demon forms themselves, mm -hmm. uh, tries to use her powers with the Maya's powers. knowledge of Hydus, um, but she ends up fighting. Uh, she ends up fighting against Siegfried and uh, eventually killing him or ending him. Okay, right um, now, um, now Siegfried was oh yeah, I don't know either the final boss or the second to last boss in Wild Arms One, uh, because there's a uh, oh okay, there, there's like a sort of group of demons that are the main antagonists in that game, and I, I think <laughs> I think the I think like the matriarch is a demon called Mother, and then Siegfried is like the sort of leader of Mother's demons. And either Siegfried or Mother or some upgraded version of one of them is the final boss in that game. Huh. Okay. And that's so, and, that's and, interesting. And if the prophets uh. summon Siegfried, he's probably like some demon of legend or some, you know, general of the demons that died out many, many uh, centuries ago in the, you know, in the Wild Arms 3 timeline. I, I know that all of the Wild Arms games take place on Filgaia, but I do not know how they're related exactly. Yeah. And it's interesting that you bring up um, mother because there's a mother character character that shows up as well, but it's only it's only Malik that calls her mother. Oh yeah, is uh, that the woman that he's trying to revive with uh, demon technology? The blonde woman. Yes, I, I just assumed um, that was his and mother. Yes, so and I'm not sure if if she is the mother of uh, Lee Halton and Melody as well. Um, but she does. She is revived and given back her memories uh, because of Beatrice. Mm -hmm, um, right. Well, we'll talk we'll about Beatrice go into in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so. It's interesting that Malik, when um, some mother is revived with her memories and such, it's interesting that Malik um, is rejected by her, um, and he's in his demon form, and she says that you're not the Malik I know. You're some fiend. She really mm -hmm. fixates on the word fiend. Um, and Malik um, seems to kind of lose a will to live because I imagine this was kind of his aim. Yeah. Now, he, Lee Halt has a grander plan, but. Malik seemed a little bit more psychotic than Lee Halt, at, at least when you encountered him in a couple boss fights earlier in the game, and definitely was fixating on reviving this woman as 
maybe as one of or maybe his only goal. Like he he wanted power, well maybe not quite as much as Janis did, and he uh, and he wanted to revive this person who I thought was his mother, but it might be connected to the mother from Wild Arms One. I'm not I'm not sure about that. Uh, basically, they summon Siegfried at the end of Chapter Two, and then mm-hmm. you're battling the three prophets and Siegfried and Asgard through Chapter Three. And uh, and eventually, yes. and eventually, um, um, Siegfried is trying to use Maya's powers to uh, uh, to his own to his own ends as well. Because again, Maya's powers to take on the abilities of fiction she reads is pretty insane. And, and I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure about this, but I think that librarian version of her might be closer to her true form, because I think that oh shoot, uh, like you find a book about Calamity Jane Maxwell in the game somewhere. Mm-hmm. From who's again Calamity Jane is a minor character from Wild Arms One. I think she's playable in the Alter Code F remake, and uh, and and then shares a name with Virginia, well, a surname with Virginia. And I think Maya read that Calamity Jane book, and that's where her cat, where her her you know gunslinging persona is from. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thought. I yeah, it it very well could be in her in what she thought might have been her final moments. Um, after she has this battle with Siegfried and kind of the, the whole structure that they're fighting in is closing around her, she has um, she has the book because um, she is kidnapped and she drops this book and Virginia returns the book to her and she kind of laughs to herself and she says, you know, I never did finish reading that. She's got to survive so she can finish the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. She was... Uh, yeah, that that kind of turn of phrase with it because I thought that was a resignation of it being funny that she has this book that's so dear to her that she didn't read. But I suppose that might have been kind of uh, her speaking her will to live in some way. <laughs> yeah, right on. So anyway, uh, Siegfried is not the final encounter of the game, uh, although he's definitely a reference to Wild Arms One. Maybe he also shows up in maybe he's in every Wild Arms game. Again, I've only played one and uh, one and three and not to completion. Um, but the the last part of the game, and uh, I I'm forgive me, I think it's shorter than the than chapter two or three by a significant margin. You learned about this new character, Beatrice, and I say new character in quotes because uh, Beatrice has sort of been manipulating the entire events of this world from behind the scenes. Uh, and again, I didn't get so far as to totally introduce to her, but uh, to totally be introduced to her. But there's a purple haired. Um, girl that you see running around in scenes like she might be leaving a room just as you enter it mm-hmm. and uh, or people mention about seeing a girl in her in their dreams and um, in chapter four it's all revealed that uh, Beatrice is a dream demon who is some remnant of the ancient demon civilization but does not have total efficacy in the world yet and it seems like in dreams she was manipulating the three prophets and Gallows's brother Shane, and the leader of the Ark of Destiny cult, uh, by appearing to them in dreams and and sort of influencing them to take certain actions. Like she, I think she wants the Ark of Destiny cult to uh, excavate as much technology as possible. She wanted the prophets to try and make the world terraformed so that demons could live there again. And I think she uh, basically targeted Shane so Shane could get your party. Uh, rolling on a quest to obtain the Guardians. All of these elements were so that Beatrice could, you know, come into the world in a sort of true form and make it suitable for demons again. Is that, am I basically on target or at least circling the right answer there? Yes, that seems, okay. that seems to be pretty on point. Okay, so Beatrice, again, in the first three chapters, there's no explicit mention of her. You see, uh, you see glimpses of her and mention of her in, appearing to people in dreams. Uh, when I was playing the game, I remember Shane sa- sa- having a woman speak to him in dreams, and I remember uh, the leader of the Ark of Destiny mentioning the same thing, and he, he called her the saint. And I wondered if they were the same people, like if the leader of Ark of Destiny had the same powers that Shane did. And it's, and it's less that they had the same powers and more that they were being spoken to by the same puppet master. Exactly. And to wit... Beatrice is the central villain of chapter four. She's sort of the final encounter. Like I've been manipulating all this from behind the scenes. Now you have to stop me from trying to uh, like bring this world back to the demons. And then you fight a boss fight against her. 
and then another boss fight against the final boss, which you have not hit yet, but I, I, just in my brief reading about them, is a 10-stage boss fight that might take multiple hours to finish, unless you're severely overleveled and overskilled. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so basically... Oh, the, Jesus the, Christ. The, so there's basically a... Um, so far, what I've seen of it is that there are seven elemental uh, demons that you have to fight and then there is a there's an unlucky guardian that you have to fight and then you get to this um, disaster I think is the is the boss's name um, and if you don't you can technically get to that boss without beating the previous seven you just have to beat the unlucky guardian but mm. when you get there that boss can use seven different elemental attacks in one turn. <laughs> so unless you have elemental wards, you're uh, you're done. <laughs> right. You're not going anywhere. Oh so, man! Because I tried to do that, and uh, I was like, you know what? I've heard that this is really difficult. I don't have much time right now. Let me just try to see that. So I finished the. Luck Guardian, and uh, then I got my stuff rocked. <laughs> uh, there's, again, I don't really know where to begin here. The The boss fights in this game, um, I, I think, are interesting from a JRPG perspective. Because, uh, and I'm hesitating a little bit about this because I probably fought less than half the boss fights in the game, uh, Fewer and fewer of them feel like damage sponges. Like, almost every single boss encounter has some kind of gimmick or strategy that you have to, that you have to exploit. Now, that's true for a lot of JRPG boss, bosses, but it, I don't know. In Wild Arms 3, almost all of them seem like a puzzle. Like, uh, like th this, I don't know, this, this, uh, this will heal all of its allies, so you have to take that one out first. Or this one... Has a has an instant death attack, so you should do that one first. Or this one, you barely do any damage to it, but if you can reflect its attacks back at it, it will deal uh, a lot of damage to itself. It feels like, I, I don't know, it feels like like an early SNES RPG in that way, and that every boss encounter has at least some gimmick to learn or discover. And the fact that the final boss is in, I don't know, seven to ten stages and has specific elemental abilities or a different gimmick for every phase of the boss fight. I don't, I don't know, it's maybe the most extreme version of a Wild Arms 3 boss fight, but it's basically in character. Am I am I wrong here? Like, I, again, I haven't, I haven't fought it myself, but Wild Arms 3 is a puzzle-heavy RPG, and the boss fights, I think, are miniature puzzles in their own right. It's not just keep your health up and keep attacking for every boss. Yeah, that's that's been something that's been continuing throughout the game, is that there really hasn't been a boss fight where I've just, they've just been a damage sponge. Some of them are difficult. Some of them, some of them um, have like a certain trick. And once you get that trick, they're fine. Some of them um, just take a lot of strategy to think through. I like a lot of the guardian fights, especially. Mm, yeah. And some of them are just so, some of them are just so bizarre. Um, there was, there was one in particular that I thought was hysterical where there's this little star and this and this it was like star junior or something like that and then dad star or something i can't remember their exact names um but the dad star would always protect the little one um shield him from any damage he's like you're not touching my son and he would shield any physical attacks um but then on his turn he um he would do this really weird move where he would just jump into your character and explode and basically one shot your character. And then he falls down and you have a turn to knock out his son while he's down before his son revives him back to full health. So he can go jump in front of you and explode again. And the cycle continues. I'm not sure what's the most remarkable boss fight to me, but almost all of them have, a gimmick to discover and react to, or, uh, um, or, or something you could plan to do. Like, uh, like in the, the sec, the third or fourth fight against Janice, he, uh, does a, a big all hitting attack every other move. And, um, 
and and on his off turn he'll like recharge and maybe counter attack a little bit so you can plan to defend his his big hit and then recover and attack him on the off on the off turn so it, it's it, there's some level of planning and puzzle solving in most of the boss fights but for the most part regular enemies uh i mean they'll have elemental weaknesses and uh and they'll take a lot of damage from uh from jet and clive unless they have a specific gimmick but for the most part it feels like regular encounters are uh, try not to lose a lot of health and and, dis- and destroy them quickly. And boss fights are figure out the boss's gimmick before you defeat them. And again, that describes a lot of JRPGs, but it just seems very, very present in Wild Arms 3, that there's a lot of puzzles in the dungeons and puzzles in the boss fights. Yeah, even though even though it's really gimmicky, though, I've, um, I've had a lot of fun with this battle system. Mm, it's yeah. really blossomed now. I think it really hits its stride when you get to level 25 because then you can use um your your fp spending abilities on the first turn if you want to which gives them mm-hmm. which gives you a little bit more freedom like you don't have to have virginia attack a few times to get so you could before you can use mystic uh and uh and then also gallows will be able to use more uh, a wider range of spells in the first turn because for uh for arcana the um spells that you cast from guardians don't spend FP, but you need to be at a certain level of FP to cast different uh, strengths of spells. So keeping your FP high is important for Gallows. So you can cast every turn. Just it, just the the uh, push pull of managing FP and having your MTC points. I don't think we even talked about summons and and, and MTCs last uh, la- in the previous episode. But uh, you you can summon these guardians, but the number of charges you have to summon depends on how many kills you've gotten with summons in previous previous terms uh, the, the way you build mtc is either using growth egg items or basically grinding summons against against uh, random battles which i did a little bit but i got sick of very quickly the, the, the combat feels like traditional turn based but then you're getting more guardians and more skills and more abilities throughout the game it's it, the the cur- the learning curve never really stops until the very end mm-hmm. yeah and at, at the place i'm at now my characters are all around level 55 so i'm just like i can unleash first turn gatling with all of them and oh it's nice it's yeah as that game as that game goes on it's uh it's so fun to have that um to have those abilities right off the bat there's something that we didn't really talk about in the first episode at all and that's the optional content in this game there's a lot um there are Millennium puzzles, and I and I wish Peter Treisenberg was here to make the appropriate Yu-Gi-Oh joke. But uh, <laughs> hidden dungeons that aren't really dungeons; it's more just like a single puzzle room or a few connected puzzle rooms that you can find with the square button by scanning the map, like like every dungeon in the game. But there's, I think, twenty of them or twenty-five or something, like between twenty and thirty of these puzzles just hidden around the game that yield rewards. And then there's the uh, the UFO side quest. Where you find these um, telepathic towers by, uh, by, if you speak to a certain NPC, he mentions that there was a UFO sighting and and mysterious towers appearing. And if you find these, I think it's fifteen of these towers. Uh, also, again, by scanning the environment with the square button, UFOs, and you can also fight UFOs in your sand ship and in your flying dragon that you near the end of the game. That it, it, f- finding these towers and defeating UFOs is another one of these side quests. And there's also a 100 floor dungeon called the Abyss that has a super boss at the end, Ragu Oragla. That is a uh, again at the end of a 100 floor dungeon and a boss fight that might take multiple hours. Uh, the the my the descriptions of I, I didn't get there of course. But the descriptions of Ragu Oragla are insane in Wild Arms Three. So those are just three of the big side quests. Plus several other side quests, like uh, you, there's a girl named Martina who's trying to um, uh, find a cure for her mother's illness, and you encounter her in a bunch of towns. And then there's a uh, there's the Gunner's Haven Coliseum that gives that you know puts you through a bunch of optional trials, and uh, there's the garden which we mentioned in the previous game where, in the previous uh, episode where there you can there's eight plant- plantable items in the game and you can grow them and sort of try to revive this young girl's garden. These optional side quests yield items called EX files. And if you collect a bunch of EX files, you basically can bring more and more items through a new game plus. Mm-hmm. And that is just an incredible volume. 
you, you played this game for over 50 hours and probably didn't do a lot of the optional content. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's in, it's pretty incredible how much is how much is in this game because um, yeah, I've done a little bit. I've done like one uh, Millennium Puzzle um, and uh, and I did Gunner a little bit of Gunner's Haven because it's story necessary. Um, and I did the first 10 floors of the abyss because it is needed for the story. Um, okay. I definitely didn't get to the optional abyss segment. Oh God. The, the, the abyss wasn't as hard as I, as I thought it would be. Um, from, I only went through 10 floors of it, but yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing a hundred floors of that. That is, uh, uh, <laughs> it is, it is kind of, it would be kind of a nightmare. There's a lot to do in this game, and if you do everything there is to do, you're you're hitting the many dozen of hours range. And uh, I am not going to hit that range. I want to finish this game, and I probably will later this year. But I, I don't think I'm going to get. I'm going to try and beat Ragu or Ragla or get some more than a couple EX files. How about yourself, Joe? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm pretty similar to you, where I kind of uh, beat a game and and move on. Um, I kind of do what I see, and I don't try to seek out too much more. Um, like, I don't try to go through a walkthrough and try to 100% a game. Um, mm -hmm. I did I did use, a like, a walkthrough for a bit of this because I'm, <laughs> because I'm, a, like, we're, we're adults here, and, uh, and this game would take even, uh, take a pretty incredible amount of time um, in some of these cases. Oh yeah, I, I use a walkthrough for, for several portions of this game, just, just for time-saving reasons. Yeah. And in fact, I, I, I use walkthroughs not every time I play a game, um, but if, if I'm playing a game for a podcast or if I'm just ready for something to end, I will, I'll sometimes I'll follow a walkthrough very closely. And, uh, and, and, but, and for this one, I, I mean, I was trying to finish it in time, even though I miserably failed at that. So, so I'm, I'm, I will never judge someone for wanting a walkthrough. But, but Wild Arms 3 takes a walkthrough but this is a kind of game you might want to walk through for just because there's such a game here and most of it is hidden behind puzzles and uh, speaking of puzzles uh, did you have a favorite that you encountered throughout the game because dungeon has one right oh let's see favorite puzzle um i've i really liked um there's this one puzzle where you had to use every basically every character's uh, ability, like all of them were used in it, and I can't remember what exactly it was. Um, I particularly like the puzzles that, as you get on later in the game, you get the Gale Crest um, for Virginia. Um, and you, oh yeah, I think that's I think that's a tool in Wild Arms One also. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it. Um, yeah, it kind of allows you to turn into a mist that can go across small gaps um, and traverse through the floors really quickly, which is really... Ah, so it's a, a Castlevania Symphony of the Night tool. Got it. Yes. And um, <laughs> it is very useful if you're going in a straight path down a hallway and you don't want any random encounters. So so angle your character, uh, angle your character a bit and you can just kind of glide through a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, rooms without having to do random encounters, which was a wonderful thing to learn. <laughs> I like a lot of the puzzles where you're hanging from uh, from grates or uh, or hanging from uh, floors with bars on on the bottom of them uh, because mm -hmm. I I just it just reminds me that every single video game character has unbelievable grip strength and they can <laughs> they can you know from a hanging position can flip up to the uh, to the floor above them. <laughs> yeah. Um... Uh, Maybe not quite as pronounced as like a, as I don't know a game with way too much climbing, like an infamous game or an Uncharted game. But I, I just I'm always amused by the ridiculous climbing ability of uh, video game characters. But but uh, since you're using the tools that you get from the opening chapters throughout the final dungeon of the game, this game really um, gets creative and interesting with its puzzles. Yeah, I'm zero percent surprised that that our mutual friend Steph loves this game because it's just so full of puzzles. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yeah, there are some. There's some pretty tough puzzles in it. You know, it's not it's not the most difficult ones I've seen. I'm trying to think of. Like I like. I, 
how is it explained that to clean off a window, you have to shoot ice at it? That was, yeah, that was the one um, in the last episode that I was referring to where I was like, whereas like, it's, this is the, there's going to be the solution to two different things and it's not going to make any sense why it is. And yeah, that was the freezer doll. Maybe it's, maybe the freezer doll uh, shoots out a jet of water and you're washing the window. Yeah. I, 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 don't, know. I don't know. It may, maybe, but like I, I was, when I hit that, when I'm like, this is probably the one that Joe was telling me. About. <laughs> but there was a, uh, but yeah, the puzzles aren't always very well explained, and there was a cu- there's a couple that require you to put in a password, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I remember I, I struggled with one for a little bit because I was including the article the in in the password, but there wasn't enough room to fill it out. I did the same uh, thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and th- so there's like you know little. Um, just annoyances to some of them, but there's just so much RPG in this RPG that I, that it's frankly unbe- unbelievable to me. And, uh, and, and it's long and I didn't get to the end, but it also has a, a pretty serviceable story that as, at least asks interesting questions mm-hmm. with, with a, a couple twists, like, like uh, jet isn't fully human and Beatrice was manipulating everything uh, from behind the scenes all along and a pretty likable cast and setting that I, we already talked about at length for two podcasts. Um, this is a pretty top to bottom polished RPG. Like I, I understand why it only got average reviews um, when it was new because it, it's not really aimed at a mainstream audience. Again, there's just a huge abundance of puzzles and, uh, and, and it's kind of over, maybe over long and uh, the, some parts of it might be inscrutable to people that aren't already big fans of RPGs, but th- there's a lot of good here and it makes me slightly, and it also makes me slightly disappointed that, uh, that this um, this developer media vision is are making what they're, they're doing uh, Digimon games and ports of Valkyria Chronicles now. Yeah, yeah, that seems to be the bulk of it. As, as someone who does enjoy D- Digimon, I'm kind of disappointed that they're not making Wild Arms Six, it's just because I'm, I'm I'm very intrigued by this, and I think I want to beat this later this year and look into prices for Alter Code F next year. Yeah, and I mean this game has really. It seems this game has really flown under the radar. When I was looking for um, podcasts to help, like where people were talking about it to help explain it and such, not really a whole lot came up when, you know, Googling Wild Arms 3 podcast. Whereas, you know, for for a lot of the more popular RPGs, you know, you put in Final you know, Final Fantasy Final Fantasy podcast of any sort and you have just Loads of options of analysis and themes, characters. I'm not sure. I mean, there's a handful of good JRPG podcasts out there that aren't um, in the RPG fan family. Like, oh, shoot, Acts of the Blood God and Ooh, Watch yeah. Out for Fireballs mm-hmm. and Square Roots are three of the biggest ones. But Wild Arms is a niche series. And uh, the only reason I know about it is because of people that I met through niche forums like uh, RPG fan and the previous place where I was a staff person, Caves of Narsh. Uh, there's this is a slightly niche series that I think has a lot of meat there for uh, real like art JRPG fans that are really invested in JRPGs to snack on. But it is does not have the uh, level of of um, iconography or accessibility that a big Final Fantasy or even a Persona game has. Mm-hmm. This is this is good, but it's also niche, and it might be dead because the last Wild Arms game I think was the PSP one that no one liked. That had, that was like had uh, strategy RPG elements. Yeah, uh, but again, I mean, I was really impressed with this game. I want to I want to revisit it and finish it, and uh, and again, it won a poll that had some very popular uh, second options on on it. So there was, you know, uh, th- this is. A, a niche game, um, but definitely one that fans of JRPGs are aware of and has a level of cult popularity. And I think that cult popularity is earned. I don't think this is a bad RPG that that I was disappointed by by the end, like some other games I've played on this podcast. This is, like, I, I wish it had uh, a few more modern amenities and maybe some voice acting, because it's a, it's a little unusual playing a, uh, a 2002 game with zero voice work in it other than lyrics to the uh, opening song and end song. But uh, this is, this is a good game that is, that, that is just, this does not feel like a game ahead of its time. It feels like a JRPG from 2002. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's a game that anyone who who is listening who will be listening to us speak uh, on this podcast, I would rec- I would probably recommend them play it. Um, but to my friend who is like, oh man, I just beat The Witcher Three, and man, that's a great game. I'll be like, uh, I don't think I can get. I, I don't think I can hit you up with the Wild Arms Three yet. <laughs> I mean, if you know a jrpg fan that maybe loves final fantasy and is looking for something a little different but mm-hmm. is definitely a J- jrpg as hell then like put wild arms 3 on the list i think this yeah. is this is a good rpg of its era and does a couple unique things and a couple things that are that you've seen a hundred times before in other rpgs but it, i think it comes recommended i don't know if it's a top 10 ps2 game for me in fact i'm pretty sure it isn't but uh, the PS2 had an incredible RPG library, and I think Wild Arms 3 fits comfortably in that library. And, and again, I, I think I'm probably most interested in beating this game and then looking into that remake of one, because the, the first Wild Arms I had just a really good group of core characters, and, and it was a pretty satisfying JRPG while I was playing it. But I, I don't know if I'd want to go back to a 1997 or 1996 PS1 game mm-hmm. when, when, a, uh, when a popular PS2 remake is, exists. But... Yeah, overall, I had a positive experience with this game, and I want to finish it. And I'm sure that this whole episode, people were snarling and yelling at me, listening, uh, like, like that, that I was getting names wrong or missing details just because I didn't fully invest uh, my way into completing it. And for that, I apologize. But again, I, I just had a difficult week, and I've, uh, <laughs> I, I've probably done too many podcast episodes in a row. I'm, I'm going to have to take part of October off. Uh, speaking of which, I, I think we're near the end of the episode, Joe. Uh, we're basically agree that this is a good RPG of its time and does a lot of interesting things. Yeah, I yeah, I agree. I mean, this is an this is a Wild West RPG where by the end of the game you are flying around in basically a Zoid named Lombardia who just wants to go mm-hmm. to bed. Like a sleepy mecha space dragon. Yeah, I like if that's not a ringing endorsement, I like I oh, don't yeah. know what to tell you. <laughs> Sleepy Mecha Space Dragon. Those are four words I love all chained together amazingly. As, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I need to keep playing just to get to Lombardia. Yeah, we didn't even mention like collecting dinosaur bones to upgrade your, your sand ship. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 getting into, and getting into like ship battles, like tank battles in your, in your sand ship. There are, also, there are also Lombardia battles. <laughs> oh, man. And we didn't even mention all the stuff you can do in Gunner's Haven. And, and again, there's... there's uh, like at least 10 tasks of various degrees of investment to, to get like the, the end game bonuses for carrying into a new game plus, which is crazy. I have a 0% chance of getting the platinum trophy on the PS4 version of this game. But I, I think we're at the end of the episode. Like there, there's a lot to like here, but it was a little bit too much RPG for my busy September schedule, unfortunately. So uh, I think Joe, now it's time to move on to October. Uh, there are five Thursdays in October, which means five episodes of retro encounter. And we have four of them mapped out. Um, in the first half of the month, we are going to do another spoiler cast, this time all about Fire Emblem Three Houses. Uh, that game came out in uh, July, I think. I'd have to check a calendar for that. So uh, we've had um, a lot of staff members on the site uh, a couple months to, to play it, and now they're itching to talk about it. So that uh, is going to be next week. Uh, if, you're, if you've played through Fire Emblem Three Houses and are eager for, to hear a discussion on it, that is exactly the podcast for you. And then following that, we're going to do an episode all about Link's Awakening. Uh, now, Joe, you weren't with the website yet, but uh, I think about, or well, I know, about a year and a half ago, we did an episode of Link's Awakening for Zelda Month, which was April 2018. So I, I played Link's Awakening for that episode in, I don't know, February or March of 2018. And then a couple months later, the Switch remake gets announced, and a bunch of people are excited about Link's Awakening again. That, that uh, Switch game came out about a week ago. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk, uh, have another episode on Link's Awakening to talk about the original game and the Switch remake right after the Fire Emblem episode. And then after Link's Awakening, we are going to have two episodes on Grandia, which recently had a uh, Switch port and I think very soon is having a, a PC port in, uh, in, in October, I think. I'd have to, again, I'd have to check RPG Fans News Archive to double check that. And so two episodes on Grandia, one episode of Link's Awakening, one episode on Fire Emblem Three Houses, plus a fifth episode that I'm in the planning stages for I think I know what it is, but I'm not ready to make an announcement about it yet. So uh, th- that's the future of Retro Encounter. And if you have any uh, questions or concerns or uh, want to contact us for any reason, the best way to do so is to email retro at rpgfan.com. Uh, rpgfan.com also has message boards. 
a Facebook page, an Instagram page, a Twitter page, a Discord server, a Twitch channel. There's something streaming on that Twitch channel every day. Uh, and and Joe, you're um, on the social media team for the website, so you uh, you curate and post on many of those social media pages. Yes, uh, you can mostly uh, hear me on Facebook and Twitter. Yes, Steph is our Instagram queen. Yes, uh, and uh, and she does a fine job with it. But uh, but yeah, you, Nilsson, Lucy, and Steph do a really good job on our social media. We we our social media presence has been, you know, uh, uh, waxing and waning with how much quality staff we have. And right now we're in a very good place with that. So you're, you're really killing it on social media, and it's very appreciated. Oh, thank you. But uh, the, you can visit all those uh, facets of RPG Fan. We also have three other podcasts, uh, Random Encounter, which is about current events, and that's hosted by Greg Delmage, Rhythm Encounter, which is about RPG music, and it's currently on hiatus, and a new podcast, that isn't that new. They've been uh, in action for over a year. Phoenix Edge, which is a uh, podcast hosted on YouTube and also their own podcast feed, has joined the RPG fan family. They're being uh, they're, they're having links to their RSS feed and YouTube page on the uh, RPG fan main uh, website, and we're going to be cross-promoting each other. They're, uh, uh, retro Encounter is re going to stay Retro Encounter, Random is going to stay Random, and Phoenix Edge is going to stay Phoenix Edge. But now we're, uh, our, uh, you know the different groups can cross-promote and cross-pollinate a little bit. And we're really excited to be working with the trio behind uh, the Phoenix Edge RPG podcast. And I, I haven't listened to every episode in their oeuvre, but I've listened to several, and they do, they do good work. So please check out Phoenix Edge in addition to Random Rhythm and Retro Encounter. And uh, you can review all four of those podcasts on iTunes or Google Play or however you are listening to us. Uh, please provide any feedback you are willing to. And um, hmm, let's see. I think I've, I've hit every single item on the checklist, Joe. Uh, now it's the time where we give the audience our personal social media, and then sign off. So how can listeners reach you? So you can reach me um, if you're not going through RPG fans' uh, social medias themselves. You can reach me on Twitter or the Discord servers, both under at Queers for Fears. And that's usually my name on like Instagram as well. So so reach out. Um, if, you have any, if you want to talk Wild Arms, if you want to... Uh, talk about RPG fan, or if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. All right, you know I don't have an Instagram, but I think I have a. I think my social media stamina is about spent because I'm on <laughs> Twitter all the time. I haven't gotten rid of my Facebook page, and I'm on uh, Slack all the time, and that, that's about as much as I can as I can stand. So I'm, 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 I might be uh, I, I might be just too old and too uncool for Instagram. I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, mine's mostly just for like selfies and thirst posting you know what i mean like oh thirst posting, you say. oh man <laughs> you know, if, we, if we if we if we could only harness the power of thirst then the world's energy crisis would be solved immediately we could say uh, we could say full gaia with thirst power we could restore phil gaia to be greener than the earth of of 1000 bc if we could, <laughs> if we could harness the power of thirst but uh, uh speaking of the power of thirst i'm Pretty thirsty on Twitter sometimes, uh, but uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, most easily at, either at the Real Monsoon or at Evoker for Dogs. I'm also Monsoon on RPG Fans forums and Monsoon Mike on RPG Fans Discord. And uh, most of the time, if you email retro at RPGFan.com, I am the person responding. So, Joe, um, I think we went in here uh, looking for a fistful of Gellas, and we got a few Gellas more. I'd say, yeah. I think this podcast was plenty good, bad, and ugly over various parts. Yep. Over the span uh, of 10 minutes in a game. Yeah. Those emotions were all felt. <laughs> yep. Duck, you sucker! Thank you.